Conclusion Our Lord's Exodus at Jerusalem, Part 2 We began our study of Exodus with Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 31, and we saw that the word translated as decease in verse 31 is in the Greek text exodon, the root of which is hodos, or way. Ex is a preposition, a prefix to hodos, so that, very literally, the word exodus means the way out. Thus, the exodus of Israel is out of Egypt into the Promised Land. Our Lord's exodus is premised on this earlier way out, in that it signifies a mighty deliverance, the way out for Christ's new humanity. According to St. Paul, Jesus Christ is the last Adam, the head of the new humanity recreated by him. We are made anew in his image to become God's new human race. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 and 46. We are told that God the Son became man. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11 was totally obedient to God's law, paid the penalty of death for which we were all liable, dying in our stead, and rose again from the dead to become the victorious God-man, king over all creation. His victory on the cross was over the power of sin and death, both of which mark all men born of Adam. The fact of sin is a very important theological anti-sociological one, and yet very much neglected in modern thought. The problem more commonly discussed is crime. But sin and crime are two very different things. Crimes are violations of status law. In some cases, crime and sin can be identical acts which are very different in meaning. Thus, murder and thefts at present are crimes because state law prohibits them. As violations of God's law, they are also sins, but they are prosecuted as crimes. Crimes commonly include the failure to meet a variety of statist, bureaucratic regulations which have no relationship to morality in any biblical sense. According to Wilhelm Pauk, sin is an act or attitude by which the reality of God is denied or violated. This at least points us in the right direction, because sin does deny or violate the reality of God. It assumes God's non-existence and then establishes a man-centred or state-centred moral code and law without any regard for God's law. Such a humanistic perspective leads to tyranny, because it makes man or the state the source of all definition and the determiner of what constitutes good and evil. As against this, we are told by 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. This means, first, that sin is any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. God defines good and evil, and God determines law, not man. Because all the sons of Adam are sinners who seek to determine good and evil for themselves, Genesis chapter 3 verse 5 they are all under sentence of death. Second, John tells us, Jesus Christ, the sinless one, paid the death penalty for us and took away our sins so that we are now justified or made legally innocent before God by Christ's atonement. Next, Christ's victory on the cross was not only over sin, but also over death by his resurrection. Death entered the world as a consequence of sin. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Because God is life and the source of all life, John chapter 14, verse 6. To depart from him is to move from life to death. Hence, sin brings in death. Sin is therefore an exodus into death. Recently, a homosexual wrote on his hope that science would soon provide a vaccine for AIDS and enable man to continue his march into a full liberation from moral consequences. His idea of an exodus was from morality into a safe amoralism, into a freedom for perpetual sinning. A. Eustace Hayden wrote, Man has always been a Protestant against death. Even high cultures have refused to recognise its universal rule and projected the hope of an immortal life free from all future assaults of death. Certainly the subject of death has been a constant concern of men. James Hastings, Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, 1911, gave 100 pages to a survey of the subject by a number of scholars. In a 33-page introduction to the subject, E. Sidney Hartland began thus, The horror of death is universal among mankind. It depends not so much on the pain that often accompanies dissolution as upon the mystery of it, and the results to the subjects and to the survivors, the cessation of the old familiar relations between them and the decomposition of the body. This horror has given rise to an obstinate disbelief in the necessity of death and to attempts continually repeated in spite of invariably disastrous experiences of failure to escape it. Even the most natural and inevitable decease is persistently ascribed to causes not beyond human control and, on the other hand, legends of the origin of death are familiar and widespread. The picture thus presented of the desperate refusal of mankind to accept a cardinal condition of existence is one of the most pathetic in the history of the race. In recent years, the scientific attempt to destroy death has been pronounced, and some people have had their bodies frozen at death to await a hoped-for scientific resurrection in the future. Humanistic thinking separates death from sin to make it a natural and evolutionary fact, whereas for scripture, death is abnormal. It is an aspect of a fallen world order, and even as a natural order has been made unnatural by sin, warped and defective, so too life has been deformed and abbreviated by sin. When sin and death are separated, as they are in humanistic thinking, the results are very serious. God makes it clear that death is a consequence of and the penalty for sin. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, chapter 3 verses 1 to 5. In terms of this, God's law requires immediate death for some sins, as well as death for all habitual offenders. Deuteronomy chapters 18 to 21. The penalty of death for sin is set forth for personal sins and for national sins, Deuteronomy chapter 28, unless there be repentance and reformation. Humanism, however, separates sin and death. It opposes the death penalty as itself a crime. Sin is not the cause of crime. Instead, environmental factors are blamed for criminality. As a result, without Christ's atonement and resurrection, a people have no solution for the problems of sin and death. Society's humanistic policies end up as subsidies to sin and death for justice and moral order. As a society ceases to understand and honour the meaning of our Lord's death and resurrection, that society begins an exodus from life unto death. 
The exodus of modern men and nations in the 20th century has been a grim and ugly march into oblivion. For the Christian, however, life is an exodus into a new creation, of which we are told, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. All men are on an exodus, but the directions differ. Apart from Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, the exodus of a fallen humanity is from sin into death. In Christ, the exodus is into justice and life. He is the model for all creation. Arthur S. Way, in 1901, rendered Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, in these words. For it is not to angels that God has subjected the new humanity of the future, which is the theme of my argument. Witness was born to this in the prophetic passage. What is man that thou dost remember him? What is the son of man that thou dost stoop to him? Thou didst make him but little inferior to angels, with glory and honour didst thou crown him, and didst appoint him ruler over the works of thine hands, all things didst thou set beneath his feet. Psalm 8, verses 4 and 6. Now the expression, set all things beneath him, must mean that God exempted nothing from the destiny of subjection to him, but, as a matter of fact, we do not as yet see all things subjected to man, but we do see the archetype of the new humanity, Jesus, him who has been lowered to the level of humanity and so made a little inferior to angels, already, because of his suffering of the death penalty of our sin, crowned with glory and honour. This has been done that his tasting of death might, by God's grace to us, prove to have been for the sake of all humanity, for it was an act worthy of God, for whose ends all things exist, and by whose power are all upheld, to draw onward to the glory of his presence these myriads, all his sons, and so to make the captain who leads their march salvationward perfect through those very sufferings that he endured for them. All life is an exodus. Our exodus in Christ is a glorious one. This has been a Calcedon Foundation production produced by Grace Community School and Nicene Covenant Church published by Ross House Books Copyright 2004 Mark R. Rushduni If you enjoyed this audiobook be sure to visit calcedon.edu for more books and audiobooks by R.J. Rushdunie.